like there, there's one scene in particular where I was being strangled but like, even just having a, a man's hand around my throat it was it was a little bit scary delighted to welcome one and all Gina Jones is an actress known for her work in various television and film projects she was awarded the daytime Emmy Awards she has the lead role in the new film called the Sun also rises and did that manifest itself through an illness or was it just something that gradually sort of overtook your hearing, if you like? So I had a car accident and my eardrum burst. You know, I went to the doctors and they said that, you know, my ear, uh, eardrum would, would heal and my hearing would come back, but it didn't. The story focuses on my character, um, her name's Ray, and just the struggles of her life, really. You know, she does suffer from domestic abuse. Welcome to the Second Chance Podcast. I'm your host, Raphael Rowe. On this podcast, we talk to people from diverse backgrounds who share their stories of redemption, resilience, and second chance. Go to our YouTube channel so you can watch those interviews, subscribe, share, and click on the notification bell so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for coming on and talking on my podcast. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, let me start. Um, I'm recording, mm-hmm. and so I, I like to start my podcast in any way. I don't have any subscribed questions. I just want us to have a conversation um, so that the listeners can find out more about who it is that I'm talking to. And the first thing I wanted to ask you about is your acting career, because I know that you have a film in production at the moment, if not post-production or whatever stage it's at. And I know that you've been in previous films. So just tell me first what this new film, if you can talk about it, tell me what this new film is about, because then it gives an idea of the type of actor you are, or at least in this movie it does. Sure. So um, the film is called The Sun Also Rises. Um, It's due for release later this year. Um, we've still got some additional ADR work to do on it, but um, yeah, I think it's sort of a December release time we're hoping for. And the story focuses on my character, um, her name's Ray, and just just the struggles of her life, really. Um, you know, she does suffer from domestic abuse and um, kind of just see how that affects her and all the people she comes into contact with, um, so yeah, it's a heavy hitting film and British cast and just really excited about it, to be honest. Have you been in a film similar to that before? No. Um, and the kind of roles, it's not the sort of role I normally get put up for. So I remember when I got the script, um, it came through sort of, it was my birthday weekend and the email came from my agent about sort of five o'clock on a Friday and they just said, attaches the script, you know, pick two contrasting scenes and in my head you're just thinking really on a Friday do I want to read a whole script um so I got my iPad up um iPad up went upstairs and was kind of reading through it and it just grips you you know um it's got a female lead and just the way it's written you know Roland our director put a lot of work into this and developed the script and it gripped me and I was just excited, you know, to film the tape and it was hard to pick, you know, which scene you were going to show because you wanted to sort of show her, her progression. Um, and yeah, obviously did a good job because I got it and we were filming within sort of, I think, a couple of weeks. So I was so nervous, but I didn't have that time to be nervous because there was just so much work to do. Um between you know getting the job and, and being on the set you know how, how does someone get a role like that I mean for a person like me who has no understanding of how somebody like yourself gets a role is it through an agent as an agent so we'll put you up do you get the script read it and say yeah I'd like to put myself up so how did it come about that you got involved in this film so in this case it was through my agent um you know the there's a website called Spotlight, which most professional actors are registered on, and often they'll put jobs up on there, and then agents will apply. So for actors, it's kind of there's layers. You know, you have to audition to get into drama school, and then once you're in drama school, you then try and get an agent, and then once you get an agent, you have to work to try and get an acting job. 
so you're always kind of jumping through hoops um and I think Roland went directly to my agency and kind of it came through and you read for so many jobs you know and you just don't hear back and you know I, I saw this and I thought please and I thought no no I'm not gonna you know pin my hopes on it because you know it's a lead role and it's got an amazing cast and sort of did it and forgot about it so when I got that email I just yeah I was over the moon what did you have to do to um to cast yourself I mean what what was it they expected of you and how do you do that do you I mean when when I see it on movies you see the individual standing on a stage in front of three very self-important people looking at you reading from the script or performing in a certain way and then they kind of roll that person off and on comes the next person and they just go through so many different people until there's that moment, that kind of euphoria moment where they say that's the person. Is that what it's really like? Is that what it was like for you? I think prior to lockdown, you know, you'd go into a room and there'd be a panel like that and um, you'd do the audition. But with lockdown, everything's become virtual. So you sort of spent two years auditioning in your bedroom just talking to yourself um and it it was hard to get someone else to read with you because often you only have sort of a day's notice for this audition and you need to find someone to come and you know come over and practice lines with you and stuff so um for this one it was it was just a zoom zoom audition was it is it easier to do it via zoom because you're there's a distance between you and the people and you can sort of prepare yourself and then go for it or is it easier to be stood in i don't know on a stage with the panel watching you because you can express yourself more can't you you can get across i'm sure a lot more of your character or the character that you're casting for i mean i miss I, i'm a people person and i miss being in the room with other actors and 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 being in the room and just doing the audition but I've kind of got quite used to uh the zoom audition life you know you haven't got all the traveling into London and yeah I don't mind um I think we'll probably end up over time hopefully it'll end up um back how it used to be but we'll see you said it all started when you went to um drama school how how did that come about was it something that you wanted to do, wanted to be from a little girl that, you know, I want to be an actor because you saw someone who inspired you in a particular film or show and you said, that's what I want to do. Or was it, you know, a parent bringing you to the stage every day, some drama school, like some do take their boys or girls to football or netball. How did it come about that you wanted to become an actor? So I was painfully shy as a child. Um, I mean, I was bullied quite a lot at school. Um, I was the only person of colour. Um, and I mean, there was, I'm sure people have had it a lot worse, but there was definitely a, a racial element to it. And it just kind of crushed me. But I think I'd always had a love of it. I mean, my dad always tells this story. Um, when I was little, I loved Disney films and I would recite a lot of the the film you know I'd be doing all the different characters and one day we were out shopping and I was doing uh, I think it was Sleeping Beauty and there's a bit where Maleficent says stand back you fools and at three years old I sort of proclaimed this to my parents obviously they knew what I was saying but there were people passing just shocked uh, that this little three-year-old was so rude but you know that wasn't the case um so I think there were always elements that I definitely loved performing but I was I was so I was bullied so much that it just made me so shy um and it was only sort of I think I was about 14 and I joined a local drama club and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I just completely came out of my shell and we weren't good you know we did some shockingly awful plays and I remember this one play we did and we had this sort of school bus that we built on the stage and we had the script hidden just to make sure we were doing it right. And someone said a line about 10 minutes in that was from the second half and the whole play, we were just trying to put it back together, but it it was such good fun and such a good experience for me. Um, And I think from there, I kind of made that decision that 
everything I did, I was going to try and move forward in that direction. And I didn't know how I was going to get there. But I just knew, you know, if you do one small thing over time, those those small things, they help and they, they build you up to get to kind of where you want to go. But before you got there, you talked about being bullied at school and experiencing racism being the only person of colour in your school what was that like I mean lots of people talk about being bullied at school lots of people talk about being racially abused but as an individual what was it like for you and where was that coming from I mean where did you go to school in England I presume was it in a remote area where people were racist was it in London so I went to school in Essex and that's where I'm from and that's where I grew up um I mean, I'm mixed race, so my my mum's black and my dad's white. And as a child, you know, that's just, it was just normal to me, you know, like people have different colour hair, people had different colour skin, and we had friends who were all different races. And it wasn't something I even really, you know, naively didn't think about as a child. And then it was only when I went to school that it was such a shock that people had a problem with it. And it just it was hard it was really hard and there was no one else at the school that kind of really understood what it was like um but you know you move forward and but it was hard it's an interesting one I mean I'm mixed race myself only the other way around my mum's white and my dad's black and um I I always I always remember the kind of racist language that my parents would use when they argued, which sort of prepared me for what I would experience in the outside world. So when I heard people call in other people a black this or a white this, it meant nothing to me because it was normalised in my household. You know, my parents loved each other, yet they used these terms when they were arguing, um, meaning no harm, but it was just par for the course. How did it shape your character that you are today then, going through that experience of being bullied and experiencing racism? I think it's a, being mixed race, it kind of gives you a, a unique view in some ways, you know, because around at school where I was the only person of colour, I was black, but then you'd sometimes be in a, a black community and you're not black. And sometimes people want you to, to pick one and... It's like, I, I can't pick one. I'm, I'm equally both. And I mean, growing up, it was really hard. And even little things like if I remember my mum tried to take me to get my hair cut and the lady was just like, and she didn't mean it in a horrible way, but she was just, oh, oh we, we don't do that sort of hair here. You know, she didn't know what to do. And you kind of internalise all those things. You don't necessarily think about, what that meant you just start thinking that there's something wrong with you or uh, there was the gymnastics team and all the little girls had their hair plaited and the you know the lady she was white her children were white she didn't know how to do my hair and so what I went on with you know this big frizzy halo um you know and people say oh your hair looks bad or whatever um so just little things like that um but I think now as an adult it's just given me such a, a thick skin um in this industry there's so much so much of it is rejection and it just you just don't take it personally and i think it's um definitely given me an inner strength for sure the role that you play in the new film that's coming out soon um being the victim of domestic violence was that an easy character to play? Uh, do you have any of that experience in your own life that you could draw on or is it something you had to create as part of your character? So prior to, once I knew I had the role, I did as much research as I could online. Um, really, it's an important story and I wanted to really, you know, do the character justice. So, I mean, I did as much preparation as I could um, and I didn't realise how prevalent domestic abuse is, um, and especially during lockdown. Um, I just, you know, I've been privileged. It's not something I've ever thought too much about, but 
yeah, it's a, it's a massive problem. And as much as I prepared myself for the role, when I was actually doing some of the physical scenes, like there, there's one scene in particular where I was being strangled and I was in, I was in a really safe environment. We had an amazing coordinator who'd gone through everything. So I wasn't really being strangled, but even just having a, a man's hand around my throat, it was, it was a little bit scary. Um, and again, I knew I was safe and I was working with a phenomenal actor. Shame was really, you know, really great to work with, but it just, for a moment, I just had a sense of, you know, what some people go through and it's harrowing. Um, what do you take away from a movie like that? Because you've done your research beforehand so you can understand what women and men who suffer from domestic violence go through to some extent and then you've got to play a character and as you've just described, you know, going through a physical moment where people go through that in real life. What do you take away from a film like that or what do you more importantly, deliver in a film like that so that when a viewer like myself watches it, they come away thinking, what? What is it that you're hoping the film will deliver? I mean, there were some days after filming, I'd go home and I would cry. Just it had taken such an emotional sort of toll on me. Um, but I think, I hope that people come away from this film and they realise that they're not alone and that yeah, I just hope it gives people hope um, that there is help. Yeah, that's the main, main takeaway. If you were to describe the Gina Jones today, how would you describe yourself? Oh, I would say Gina Jones hasn't changed that much. She's, she's still that shy, shy girl from um, Essex, but she doesn't take any pictures sure now. You're an actor. An actor is, in my book, I think somebody who kind of shines because they can take on different characters and be different people. And you have audiences from everywhere watching your every move, your every facial expression. How, how can you be shy when you're an actor? But that's the thing. You're not you. I'm not, when I'm performing, I'm not Gina Jones anymore. You know, I don't have to be me. I have everything. I know what I'm going to say. It's 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 a safety. It's a lot scarier being you, if if that makes sense. Like you play a character, and that's almost like a, a shield. Um, it's a it's a funny one because you think you know the stage is the worst place to hide, <laughs> but um, it's like before you do a performance, I'm so nervous. And the minute I get up and I'm in character, that just goes, and it's. It's the best feeling in the world. I, you say the Gina Jones is still the same Gina Jones. What challenges have you faced in life? Um, so a few years ago, I lost my hearing in one of my ears. Um, Completely I mean, or just? About 90% and I have persistent tinnitus. Um, and that, that was a game changer. Um, tinnitus. Explain for those who don't understand what that is. So have you ever been to a nightclub or like a concert and, you know, the music's really loud and then you come out and you think, gosh, what's that awful sound? That is uh, tinnitus and it never leaves you. And it's usually worse when you're tired or, you know, you've had a long day and it's quiet and it's just there constantly, um, constantly in your ears. So with the hearing loss and the tinnitus, it makes it quite difficult um, to hear. Um, and it, I mean, that had such a profound effect on me. I, when I lost my hearing, I, I didn't know how I was going to act anymore. You know, I thought everything I've, I've worked for, I've sacrificed, it's gone. Um, and it was, took a toll. And did that manifest itself through an illness or was it just something that gradually sort of overtook your hearing, if you like? So I had a car accident and my eardrum burst um, and, you know, went to the doctors and they said that um, that would, you know, my hear, uh, eardrum would, would heal and my hearing would come back, but it didn't. Um, and it's such a weird feeling having a burst eardrum because it's, it's like being underwater and you don't realise how much your hearing affects so many different things. Like 
even eating a bag of crisps, you know, that glorious crunch you get. It's just different and it affects your balance and and all sorts. So there was that sort of adjustment period and slowly my eardrum healed, but the hearing didn't come back and the tinnitus never went. So it was just a sort of adjustment period. Um, there'd be times I'd go to like a, a loud place and you hear you hear people talk about sensory overload and it's it's not something I'd ever experienced. But at the beginning, it the only way I can describe it is it's like sounds physically hurt <laughs> and it's very overwhelming and I'd struggle to be in places where there were lots of noises or if it was like a group conversation because I couldn't hear on that side you you know you'd turn your head and you'd miss half the conversation and and I just thought how am I going to act now this is it everything everything I've worked for is you know gone like that so yeah that was um a challenge how did you manage it how did you manage it once your hearing repaired itself but you were now suffering from the loss of hearing and the tinnitus how, how do you manage that? I mean, you've just described the challenges of going out, socialising and, you know, dealing with that. But how did you manage it so that you could get on with your acting career and you could lead, I hesitate to say, a normal life because people without hearing completely lead a normal life. They sign and do other things. How did you manage it? At the beginning, I didn't, to be honest. I kind of locked myself away. Um, but... I had a really good support network um, and it was it was a gradual thing so I would avoid uh, big groups of people I'd only meet like w- one or two friends and they would be mindful and I'd, I'd make sure I sat so they were on my good side and just gradually kind of got my confidence up I got better at lip reading um, and now I just I compensate I naturally turn my head more just just little things um, but I remember working the first time after my hearing loss and um, I was so nervous, but I didn't want to tell anyone that I was deaf in one ear because I was scared I wouldn't book the job. So I'm on set and the, di- the, the director, you know, calls action, but I can't hear. I, I miss it. And then, you know, they're coming over and they're like, oh, you know, you're missing your cue. And, and then he yells, are you deaf? I mean, this was a while ago, and um, I was like, yeah, I am actually, and it felt so good to say it out loud, and there was there were no repercussions, and although I felt a bit embarrassed at the time, I shouldn't have, it, it was a turning point because I felt, you know, I said it out loud, and so what, you know, people didn't mind, so then they got someone in front of me, and when the director, you know, said action, they gave me the thumbs up, and so I think, you know, I learned from that, that there's there's no shame in admitting, you know, things you're struggling with. Um, That's really interesting. It's really interesting that you tried to hide it in order to continue your work. But once you were able to, to share the challenge you had in the roles that you played, being able to hear the word action, do you now... When you apply for a job, declare, do you have to declare something like that? I think if there was, if I was concerned, maybe that hearing was going to be an issue, then I absolutely would. But I feel like I've got enough coping mechanisms that I don't need to declare it in advance. Perhaps on the day, if I'm struggling, I would flag up and say, look, I've I've got a deafness in this ear and... Yeah, but I don't feel like it's something that I go around telling people. To be honest, I don't think I've, it's something I've ever really spoken about. Um, no, today. and I, I, I wonder actually whether it is. I mean, I wonder whether now when you're in social environments, whether you have to... I mean, I many occasions meet people where they sort of say, no, I can't hear in this side, you need to, whatever. And so you think, well, do I have to swap seats or something or speak a bit louder? It's sometimes an awkward situation for the person who has just been told, um, but also for the person who's, who's saying it, because then you have to, I don't know, adjust yourself or adjust your conversation to accommodate. Um, what's it like for you? 
That's interesting because I'd never, I never actually thought of it from um, the other person's point of view. Um, I think at the beginning, I didn't necessarily like mention it because people often, I think, thought you were joking. Like it was like a passing, oh, I'm a bit deaf, you know, people say, mm. and I'd be like, no, no, I am. I'm actually, I, I can't hear you. And during COVID, when everyone had the mask on, it was a nightmare. I could not hear anyone. I, I couldn't either. So you're not alone. <laughs> and I suppose millions of other people couldn't either. Um, gosh, yeah. So I, I, yeah. Is there any advantages to it, though? Boyfriend saying something, can't hear you, don't want to know what you're saying, you know, <laughs> or you turn your head that way so you deliberately don't have to hear he or she going on about something. There must be some advantages to it because, you know, it's not a bad thing, it's not a negative thing. There is positives in, um, I mean, the tinnitus now, that's something different because I suppose that's, a different kind of challenge but then we all have challenges in our own way in some way shape or form but are there any advantages advantages I mean I always think what God gives with one hand he takes with another you know I think even in the worst things that happen to us we might not see it now but we learn you learn something from it and I think you know in some ways it's given me an insight onto what it's like to, to, to live with different, you know, disabilities as such. Um, I mean, I'm really good at lip reading now. You know, I could watch someone across the street and I could give you a good idea of what they're saying. Really? <laughs> That's why the footballers on television cover their mouths, don't they, to avoid people yeah. like you yeah, seeing and hearing oh. what they say. <laughs> I suppose that For is sure. an advantage, isn't it? Because it gives you a skill to compensate for your loss of hearing yeah. and that's something that I don't have I mean I like to think I can read a couple of words swear words and the odd kind of I love you ones. words or whatever <laughs> but it really depends so that in itself is an advantage and where would you say you're at with it now because you say this only happened a couple of years ago are you kind of through I hesitate to say the worst but I mean are you through the challenges where at first you felt awkward about having to mention it before you got on stage or then you did I mean where are you at with it now I think I'm in a good place with it I've made peace with it um I'm able to to compensate well enough I mean if there's a big group of people I do find it tiring sometimes just because you you have to really focus on the conversation and you're you know trying to keep abreast of it but at the beginning when I thought that my acting was over, you know, to go from there to where I am now and I've got my film coming out, it's, um, yeah, I've, I've made peace with it. I still, you know, I've got two ears, still got one good ear. So um, as long as that one's working, we will right. And it's quite inspiring, really, because I suppose there are people who may be listening to this who find it might not be the loss of ear and it might be the loss of being able to use a finger or a hand or something. So these disabilities that we all have in some way, shape or form, none of us are perfect. And we have to overcome. And by hearing your story, hearing how you took advantage of say advantage but didn't allow it to slow you or stop you it might have interfered with your progress for a little bit whilst you came to terms with it but look you're back up there you're you know still doing what you love you know and will go on to do what you love what would your message be to people who are facing a similar kind of challenge not necessarily a loss of hearing but there was a moment in your life where you just said you didn't know whether you could go on acting and there will be people thinking, I don't know whether I can go on playing tennis or football or doing the things that they love simply because they've had a problem that might interfere. It didn't with you. What What do you say to people? I would say that I was stubborn at the beginning. I thought that I didn't need to talk about it and I, I would say talking and getting help from other people whether that's just having someone listen to you or I had a little bit of therapy um which at first I thought oh I don't need therapy <laughs> but the lady who I worked with was just really good at understanding kind of the challenges I was having and just helping you think about it in a different way um so I would say don't do it by yourself um 
and just 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 talk about it. it it really helps i don't want to bang on about your hearing but now i just want to ask about the tinnitus because you're right we do come home from nightclubs i've done it many occasions i'm laying in my bed drunk as a skunk my ears are ringing from the music i can't wait for it to stop and sometimes every now and again you get that sound come into your head but to have it consistently going through how do you manage manage that or is it it becomes a part of your hearing and you don't hear it unless you're having a conversation with someone like me who's reminding you of the sound <laughs> that you hear i mean how does that work i mean it's it's always there and for me that was the thing I was struggling with the most I was almost getting into a panic that I was never going to hear silence again which is I sound silly but it was just this sense of I'm never going to have a moment's peace and quiet and it was this one thing that the therapist said to me she said but we never hear silence she was like you can hear your heartbeat you can hear your breathing it's just your brain is not focusing on those and that small thing she said, that shift in my thought, it was, made such a difference. Um, sometimes when I'm ill, it's really loud and I'll just try and focus on something else. At, at the beginning, I learned how to knit. So like a granny, I just sat there and I knit this massive blanket. Not only but grannies it, that knit, you know. <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> Do you knit? I don't, know. Oh, <laughs> But um, it, it really helped to just, you know, because I'm not very good. I had to put all my t focus into, you know, making these little granny squares. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that was a real game changer for me. And is there no um, cure for, for that illness? If it's an illness, I don't know how you describe it, disability, illness, whatever it is. Is there no cure? Is there nothing that these kind of highbrow surgeons or people can do to to deal with the problem if it is a problem yeah not that not that I'm aware of this doesn't seem to be a cure at the moment um because it's not really there it's there's not really a ringing sound it's just something that my ears perceiving um oh really so hopefully I mean it can just go away <laughs> I don't want to put too much hope on that but you know one day I could wake up and it could be gone I'd still have the hearing loss but, the, you know, that might go. And does it, when you're just living your normal life, like you and I are having a conversation now and you're concentrating on the conversation that you and I are having, so it's not the focus of your thoughts. So it's probably not as prominent as in when you and I finish this call and you go to the toilet or you're laying in the bath or laying in bed, it could become more, more prominent because your focus is relaxed. Yeah. I mean, I think I do hear it all the time. I don't think there's ever a point where it, it completely goes, but it, it fades. Sometimes it's not the loudest sound in the room. And generally, if I'm busy or, or when I'm acting, I don't hear it, um, which is really nice because you're so focused on so many other things that it, it fades away. I love the idea that, that you've gone through these challenges and it's not stopped you pursuing your career as a as an actor what what's your ambition I mean you're in this movie and I suspect that you know you will continue to do the acting that you love what what's your ambition what is a I don't know an actor's ambition where, where, where do you want to be I would like to I'd like to cross over into America um, and I'd like to be in a position where I could help other people um, I could help other people just achieve, you know, that, that little girl that wants to be an actress and it feels like it's too far away. I hope that I can inspire her to follow her dreams. It doesn't even have to be acting, but just inspire people that if you want something and you work hard and you make those, like I was saying earlier, it's those small little steps. You might have want to do something and it seems so unachievable but if you put in that work and you do the little steps one day all those small steps will amount to something and, and you, you can get there and is there a particular role you'd like to play i mean you play a, a domestic violence victim in your latest film but is there a role that 
I don't necessarily mean for a blockbuster film, but a particular character that you would like to play? I mean, is there an ambition there? I mean, I have to say, I never would have thought I would have got a role um, like Ray. She's, it's such a journey she goes on and that's such a gift to an actor because you get to play a character in all the different parts of their journey and their life. And she goes on such a, such a journey you know, the highs, the lows, and you kind of, I don't want to give anything away, but you see her at different points in her life. And that was such a dream role for me um, to get that. So just more, more good writing. Um, yeah, more, more stuff like this, please. Do you have to change, you know, when you're, when you're taking on a character like that, do you have to, I know you have to not be Gina anymore and you have to be Ray, the character that you're playing. But does your whole appearance have to change? Do you have to look different? I mean, I know there's makeup and all that. I'm just intrigued by when you take on a character and they're asking you to play this woman, for example, is it based on a true story or is it just fiction where, um, you know, the story's just been written, the script has been written based on what people know about what people suffer from domestic violence? How, how, how much of it can you be you as opposed to the character you're playing I think for me there's always elements of yourself in that character you know there'll be bits you can relate to and I think you really when you're in character if she, you know some of the scenes were so heavy that actually has a physical and emotional weight on you you know you I remember there was a scene and something horrific had just happened and I was just walking, I was just slow because you were carrying the weight of what had ha what has just happened to her on you and I think you do your research on the character, you understand what's going on in the scene and that, that physically just changes you, you know. If, if she's just won the lottery, she's going to be skipping off to the shoe shop and those kind of changes I think your brain just you feel it in your body and it's very um tangible when you're not doing your day job acting what 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 do you do what does a non-actor do when they're not acting oh I have done every job under the under the sun I mean I've worked from I've worked as a waitress, a photographer, baby entertainer, face painter, makeup artist, event manager. I mean, my CV, PA, uh, you know, one day you'll be working, you know, Formula One. And then the next day you'll be scrubbing dishes in a kitchen. Um, I have <laughs> I've done so many different jobs. But those I think jobs characterise you, right? It makes you realise that there is a whole new world out there. And people are doing this. You're not doing it right now, but people are still doing those jobs and they're important jobs. You know, we mustn't undermine the work that people do. And you've been there. I've done certain things, but I've been very fortunate in, in my career. Well, not before when I was in prison, but after prison, my career has been phenomenal. So I haven't, but I was doing the washing up today. So I haven't forgotten the kind of, do you think those, those everyday things to exist builds character? Oh, without a doubt. And I think you, you have to develop such a vast range of skills um, because just to survive, you know, to be in London and afford to be able to go to auditions, but you also need to be flexible because you get a, you know, an email from your agent and they're like, you know, 12 o'clock tomorrow, you've got an audition for such and such. And you can't have a, a normal job because you wouldn't be able to get the time off. So as an actor, you're always juggling a million different things um just just to get by um and I think you meet a whole host of people and often when you're playing a character it will be loosely based on someone I may have you know worked with or someone a, a customer or something so it does give you a um a, a good selection of people to um portray how long does a, a role like that last then? I mean, from beginning to end, how long were you having to go either to the studio or to the location, wherever it was being shot on the day? How long does something like that last? Because I always 
as a journalist myself, I go off on location, I do my film, but, but people think you're doing it 24-7, they think you never stop. I mean, I don't in the terms of the work that I do. But how long does a role like that last, you know, for something to be shot? So the whole film we shot in about six weeks, and yeah, and people always say, oh, being an actor is so glamorous, and, and they think that actors just lie and say, no, it's not really glamorous, but... I spent, I kid you not, four weeks in a travel lodge. And I was, I remember turning up and I'm a creature of comfort. And as you know, travel lodges are very basic. And I literally, I packed a mini fridge. I had my tea. I had a hot water bottle, dressing gown. And I turned up and the staff were just laughing at me because I had these massive trolleys. Um and we were shooting some days, you know, your call time might be 4 a.m. in the morning and then you'd be shooting till, I mean, you know what it's like filming and you, midnight, two o'clock in the morning and then it's your sleeping patterns wiped and it's cold. And But, I mean, I love it. That's why I do it. But, um, yeah. And I suppose, again, it, it's all about the character, isn't it? Because if you're prepared to dig deep like that to do what you love, this is the side of it that not many people get to see they will only see the movie itself and watch the character but they don't see what goes on behind the scenes the pulling along your little fridge or getting up at four o'clock in the morning and then going to bed at midnight and doing the the same thing the next day is it tiring is it tiring on your mental health as well as your physical body yes I think but I mean I love I love every part of it I think the harder thing is when you're not working and you're between jobs. I think it takes a real toll on your mental health because you just you're constantly getting no's sometimes, and your friends and family will ask you, and they mean well, but they're you know, oh, did you get that job? And you're like, which one? <laughs> you know, it's it's hard. Um, or people say things to you. The classic is why don't you do EastEnders? And you're like, oh, yeah, they ring me every week, you know. Um, but sometimes it takes being in a particular film that you don't know whether it's going to be successful or not. Somebody sees it, they love your character or they like your personality and one thing leads to another. Um, so there's plenty of time, but there's just so many actors and actresses and whatnot going on out there, isn't there? I suppose there's a lot of competition for every character, every role that is popping up on Spotlight or agents are casting characters for. It must be really challenging. Um, was there ever a time where you thought enough is enough, you know, beyond when you lost your hearing? But I mean, when, like you say, it's really tough in between jobs, you know, and constantly getting no's or not hearing back from whoever it is that you're hoping to hear back from has there ever been a time when you felt enough is enough I need to go and you know keep my job at this restaurant or whatever it is I think for me I just couldn't see myself doing anything else it's I feel lucky that I've found something that I love and I just and I'm too far in now I couldn't go back <laughs> so yeah for me I I there was yeah there's apart from when I lost my hearing and that's why it was so difficult because I really thought it was over um but other than that nope when does the movie come out I think towards the end of the year so November or December release we should get a date soon and when did you finish filming it was November last year Right, Spain. so like almost the whole year before the film comes out. That's a long time, is it? Because you're excited, you finish the film, and then you've got to wait a whole year. I know what it's like. It, it, I work on the Netflix series, and it, it's the same thing. You know, we shoot all year, and then, you know, a year can go by before the the season actually drops. Although it's a bit shorter than that because we film for the whole year. It's not a six week shoot or something, and sometimes it can dr drag on. What's that like? The in between. You know, you finish the shoot. You've done the best that you can. You know it's got to go into the edit and it's going to take forever long for them to do the tricks that they do to make it the movie that it becomes. But what it's what, what's it been like since November, knowing that it's not coming out until November? It's almost like you've forgotten what you did. That's exactly it, because you start moving on to other projects and, and you're busy and other things, and then you think, oh, gosh, what did I do? Please let it be good. You know, there's this, this fear that 
I can't remember, you know, what I did in which take and, and what they're going to pick. So, oh, I just pray, you know, I've done a good job for the story and that people love it. And, and most of all, that it, it helps people. Um, that's what I really, really want to come out of this film. So It does sound like a very, very powerful film. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you've turned down roles because of the characters they want you to play? In the past, there have been a, a few things I have turned down. Um, sometimes it's been because there's been a lot of nudity um, that I felt was just uh, gratuitous. It, it, it didn't, I don't feel it added anything, um, particularly when I was younger. I went to a convent, so um, I was brought up by nuns. And I remember booking this job and it opened with this, this sex scene and it was I mean I was probably only I think 18 and I remember it and it said that the character the male character let out an animal war or something and I was just blushing and I was on the train and I was thinking oh my gosh all these people could see me naked what will sister Margaret Mary think of me and I, I rung my agent and was like I can't do it and, and they were lovely about it but um yeah, you know, a few. That's really interesting, actually, because I'm under the impression that even when there are those movies where there is a lot of nudity, a lot of sex scenes, just for the sake of it, you know, um, that it's all part of the acting. You know, gay scenes where the individuals that are playing characters are not gay, but they get so intimate, you think that they enjoyed kissing each other, two women or two men. or And I think... I think... Um, that is part of that character. So whether there are nude scenes, but I suppose you do have to have a line, don't you? There has to be a line. And if you grew up in a convent, then it's going to be even more thicker for you, I suppose. Do you still think that now, though, and maybe a few years on? I mean, it's obvious that there are roles where you say, and I think you hit it on the head there, where you sort of said it doesn't add value. And I think that's where some people get caught out, don't they? They go and do it because they just, they might need the money. It might be that they think this role is such an important role that it gives them a springboard to do something else. Um, but you obviously have strong views about what you are prepared to do and not prepared to do because you're a very attractive woman. And I suspect that lots of those roles come in your direction for that reason. Or does it? I don't know. I mean, I'm getting a bit old now, so there's there's fewer of them. But um, I think even with hindsight, I look back and I think now I'm older, would I still turn that down? And I think so. You know, there's sometimes there's been roles, particularly at the start of my career, where they would just it was just they wanted to have a, a some, some nakedness or nudity on the screen, and they write you one line and why is she naked? There's there's no reason, and I mean, each to their own. But for me, I just, I just think, oh gosh, if my mum's going to see it. I'm going to have to say to her, look, mummy, this is why it was really good. Okay, don't watch this bit. Um, you know, even my mum was like about this film. She was like, are you naked in it, Georgina? And I was like, no, I'm not naked, mummy. It's good. It's good. <laughs> so um, yeah. And do you think having that stance has not not for you personally or for mummy? But I mean, do you think having a, a strong stance where you're not prepared to do certain things, not prepared to take your clothes off in certain films, do you think it has hindered any part of your ambition to do what you do? I mean, possibly. I mean, who knows? You know, maybe you don't know where something might lead to who's directing this, might direct something else. But I would hate to do something where I look back and... I was upset with the choices I made. Um, so I'd rather I'd rather take a bit longer or, you know, go a different route, but feel happy in, in the choices I've made. I'd, I'd hate to regret I did something. So for me, this was the right, the right choice. That's a good thing. And just to end, my podcast is called Second Chance. Not everybody has a second chance. Not everybody embraces or gives a second chance. What does second chance mean to you personally and what do you think about giving people a second chance for the reason I think everyone deserves a second chance I think sometimes the hardest thing is forgiving yourself and 
I think, you know, we've, we've all made mistakes. And for me, the hardest thing is that self kind of, you can forgive yourself and then you can move on with something. I think that's important. Um, What's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Oh, <laughs> oh it's the end now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I don't even necessarily, for me, I, don't, I feel, I don't believe in mistakes per se. I feel, it sounds cliche, like, but I feel like they're lessons, you know, even stuff that I might, you, you always learn from everything. So, yeah. Do you, as your, uh, what's your view on second chances since you've been doing this podcast? I, I think it's interesting because I learn something different every time I ask someone the question. I mean, there's a lot of similar question answers. Um, I, I always struggle with the view that people don't deserve a second chance. And it means different things for different people. Would you give your cheating husband, wife a second chance in a relationship where you've got kids? You know, would you give someone a second chance if if they stood on your toe walking along the street of course you would because you know all they have to do is turn around and say sorry and you've accepted that apology it's a difficult one but I do you know I do appreciate that everybody's entitled to their own values morals of what they believe should be a second chance or forgiveness people use it as forgiveness but we all do make mistakes and I do believe that people should be given a second chance even a third or fourth chance it depends on their circumstances doesn't it it really does come down to who we are and what if you're on stage and you trip over during a really important scene that they've just spent tens of thousands of pounds on making happen and they have to go back and do it again that's a second chance. So it can mean different things in different scenarios, in different situations, you know, um, you know, you could term it like that. So I'm a strong believer in second chances, not necessarily forgiveness, but in second chances. Gina, thank you so much for coming on my podcast and sharing your story with us. It's been lovely talking to you. And I, I hope that the film goes well. And I hope the character that you play um, does do what you want it to do which is give people hope and let people know that they're not alone because it's such an important story isn't it talking about domestic violence you know people witness it experience it we know about it it's often hidden away from society it has been I mean domestic violence as a crime has only been recognized within the household in recent years you know a man or a woman could set upon their loved one in their own home and the courts and justice system wouldn't do nothing until not that long ago 20 30 years but now yeah. it's it's far more prominent so i'm sure films like the one that you've made to highlight you know the challenges not just i suppose from the victim side of point because i'm sure it also portrays other sides as you said at the very beginning so i I hope the film does does well for you and it's a springboard for you to get that role that you want to take you to <laughs> LA and do the things that yeah. you want to do. So thank you very much for coming on and sharing your story. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for watching or listening to the Second Chance podcast where we share stories of redemption, hope, resilience and second chances. Who deserves a second chance? Who has the right to give someone a second chance? and is a second chance even deserved. That's what Second Chance is all about. So subscribe if you want to be kept up to date with new episodes.